We are going to go ahead and get started with part two of Fahrenheit 451. This is the sieve and the sand. The part that we're going to do today is pages 83 through 93. So we're going to do 10 pages. And you may notice that I uh, set up a separate table here. We wanted to keep the parts separate. So we've been just adding those down below. On this one, though, we want to do it completely separate to separate out parts one and two. And immediately, we haven't even started, but we have a vocabulary word here, which you may or may not already know, sieve. So let's add this in here before we go any farther. This might give us some clue as to what the chapter is about, at least metaphorically. Sieve. And let's go to our dictionary over here and find our definition a utensil consisting of a wire or plastic mesh held in a frame used for straining solids from liquids or putting coarser from finer particles for reducing soft solids to a pulp. Okay, so we have the sieve, a strainer, a sift, and then the sand. So we can tell that this is going to be at least metaphorically about removing uh, the larger events or larger chunks of information from something smaller. So a tool with holes used to sift things is the definition that we're going to go with. Obviously, there's a lot more that we could say, but we're just doing the very basics for our vocabulary here. They read the long afternoon through, while the cold November rain fell from the sky upon the quiet house. They sat in the hall because the parlor was so empty and gray-looking without its wall lit with orange and yellow confetti and sky rockets and women in gold mesh dresses and men in black velvet pulling 100-pound rabbits from silver hats. The parlor was dead and Mildred kept peering in at it with a blank expression as Montag paced the floor and came back and squatted down and read a page as many as ten times aloud. We could not tell the precise moment when a friendship is formed. As in filling a vessel drop by drop, there is at last a drop which makes it run over. So in a series of kindnesses, there is at least one which makes the heart run over. Montag sat and listened to the rain. Is that what it was in the girl next door? I've tried so hard to figure. Oh, she's dead. Let's talk about someone alive, for goodness sake. Here in our notes, we can add this into our key events. Guy and Mildred are reading the books. And Mildred, in fact, let's do this in semicolon. Mildred wants to stop talking. So she clearly wants to go back to TV. She is not a fan of reading the books or thinking about what the books contain. Montag did not look back at his wife as he went trembling along the hall to the kitchen where he stood a long time watching the rain hit the windows before he came back down the hall in the gray light waiting for the tremble to subside. He opened another book. That favorite subject, myself. He squinted at the wall. That favorite subject, myself. I understand that one, said Mildred. But Clarice's favorite subject wasn't herself, it was everyone else and me. She was the first person in a good many years I've really liked. She was the first person I can remember who looked straight at me as if I counted. He lifted the two books. These men have been dead a long time, and I know their words point one way or another to Clarice. Outside the front door in the rain, a faint scratching. Montag froze. He saw Mildred thrust herself back to the wall and gasp. Someone, the door. Why doesn't the door voice tell us? I shut it off. Under the door sill, a slow, probing sniff, an exhalation of electric steam. Mildred laughed. It's only a dog, that's what. You want me to show him away? Stay where you are. Silence. The cold rain falling and the smell a blue electricity blowing under the locked door. Let's get back to work, said Montag quietly. Mildred kicked at a book. Books aren't people. You read and I look all around, but there isn't anybody. He stared at the parlor, 
that was dead and gray as the waters of an ocean that might teem with life if they switched on the electronic sun. Now, said Mildred, my family is people. They tell me things, I laugh, they laugh, and the colors. Yes, I know. And besides, if Captain Beatty knew about the, all these books, she thought about it. Her face grew amazed and then horrified. He might come and burn the house and the family. That's awful. Think of our investment. Why should I read? What for? What for? Why, said Montauk, I saw the damnedest snake in the world the other night. It was dead, but it was alive. It could see, but it couldn't see. You want to see that snake? It's at the emergency hospital where they filed a report on all the junk the snake got out of you. Would you like to go and check their file? Maybe you'd look under Guy Montauk or maybe under fear or war. Would you like to go to that house that burnt last night and rake ashes for the bones of the woman who set fire to her own house? What about Clarice McClellan? Where do we look for her? The morgue? Listen! The bombers crossed the sky and crossed the sky over their house, gasping, murmuring, whistling like an immense invisible fan, circling the emptiness. Let's add a couple of things into our key events. One, something is sniffing at the back door. And we're going to put in parentheses, dog, because we don't know if it's a dog. We don't know if it's the electronic dog that is out to murder people. We don't know uh, what it is or if it's just a guy being paranoid. We also here want to add in our notes, the bombers are flying overhead. And we can think about what Beatty mentioned. Make people forget about war. We don't want to talk about war. War is unpleasant. So if the country is going to war, it tells us that there's a lot more going on. The people in charge are aware of what's going on outside of this society, but nobody else knows they're keeping it from them, which has all sorts of implications that are probably not good. Jesus, God, said Montag, every hour so many damn things in the sky. How the hell did those bombers get up there every second of our lives? Why doesn't someone want to talk about it? I find this to be an interesting parallel with our modern thoughts about drones. We started and won two atomic wars since 2022. Is it because we're having so much fun at home we've forgotten the world? Is it because we're so rich and the rest of the world so poor and we just don't care if they are? I've heard rumors. The world is starving, but we're well fed. Is it true? The world works hard and we play. Is that why we're hated so much? I've heard the rumors about hate too once in a while over the years. Do you know why? I don't, that's sure. Maybe the books can get us half out of the cave. They just might stop us from making that same damn insane mistakes. I don't hear those idiot bastards in your parlor talking about it. God, Millie, don't you see? An hour... Two hours with these books and maybe? The telephone rang. Mildred snatched the phone. And she laughed. Yes, the white clown's on tonight. Montag walked to the kitchen and threw the book down. Montag, he said, you're really stupid. Where do we go from here? Do we turn the books in? Forget it? He opened the book and read over Mildred's laughter. Poor Millie, he thought. Poor Montag, it's mud to you too, but where do you get help? How do you find a teacher this late? Hold on. He shut his eyes. Yes, of course. Again, he found himself thinking of the Green Park a year ago. The thought had been with him many times recently, but now he remembered how it was that day in the city park when he had seen the old man in the black suit hide something quickly in his coat. The old man leapt up as if to run, and Montag said, Wait! I haven't done anything! cried the old man, trembling. No one said you did. It sat in the green, soft light without saying a word for a moment, and then Montag talked about the weather, and the old man responded in a pale voice. It was a strange, quiet meeting. The old man admitted to being a retired English professor who had been thrown out upon the world 40 years ago when the last liberal arts college shut down for lack of students and patronage. His name was Faber. And when he finally lost his fear of Montag, he talked in a cadenced voice, looking up at the sky and the trees and the green park. 
And when an hour had passed, he said something to Montag, and Montag sensed it was a rhymeless poem. Let's look up that word here for our vocab, cadence. A modulation or inflection of the voice or a sequence of notes or chords comprising the close of a musical piece. Or add that here into our vocabulary. So a series of notes or a rhythm. Then the old man grew even more courageous and said something else that was a poem too. Faber held his hand over his left coat pocket and spoke these words gently, and Montag knew if he reached out, he might pull a book of poetry from the man's coat. But he did not reach out. His hand stayed on his knees, numbed and useless. I don't talk things, sir, said Faber. I talk the meaning of things. I sit here and know I'm alive. That was all there was to it, really. An hour of monologue, a poem, a comment, and then... Without either acknowledging the fact that Montag was a fireman, Faber, with certain trembling, wrote his address on a slip of paper. For your file, he said, in case you decide to be angry with me. I'm not angry, Montag said, surprised. We should add this into our notes as well as a key event, even though it happened in the past. Probably important. Montag remembers... Meeting a man who could teach him about books. Mildred shrieked with laughter in the hall. Montag went to his bedroom closet and flipped through his file wallet to the heading, Future Investigations? Question mark. Faber's name was there. He hadn't turned it in and he hadn't erased it. He dialed the call on a secondary phone. The phone on the far end of the line called Faber's name a dozen times before the professor answered in a faint voice. Montag identified himself and was met with a lengthy silence. Yes, Mr. Montag? Professor Faber, I have a rather odd question to ask. How many copies of the Bible are left in this country? Well, I don't know what you're talking about. I want to know if there are any copies left at all. Now, this is some sort of a trap. I can't talk to just anyone on the phone. How many copies of Shakespeare and Plato? None! You know that as well as I do! None! Faber hung up. Montag put down the phone. None. A thing he knew, of course, from the firehouse listings, but somehow he'd wanted to hear it from Faber himself. In the hall, Mildred's face was suffused with excitement. Well, the ladies are coming over! Let's look up that word to add to our... Vocabulary, suffuse, gradually spread over. We will also add in here, there are allegedly no copies of the Bible, Shakespeare, or Plato left. Montauk showed her a book. This is the Old and New Testament, and... Oh, don't start that again! It might be the last copy in this part of the world. You've got to hand it back tonight, don't you? Captain Beatty knows you've got it, doesn't he? I don't think he knows which book I stole, but how do I choose a substitute? Do I turn in Mr. Jefferson? Mr. Thoreau? Which is least valuable? If I pick up a substitute and Beatty does know which book I stole, he'll guess we have an entire library here. Mildred's mouth twitched. See what you're doing? You'll ruin us. Who's more important, me or that Bible? She began to shriek now, sitting there like a wax doll melting in its own heat. He could hear Beatty's voice. Sit down, Montag. Watch delicately, like the petals of a flower. Light the first page. Light the second page. Each becomes a black butterfly. Beautiful, huh? Light the third page, from the second and so on. Chain smoking, chapter by chapter. All the silly things the words mean. All the false promises. All the secondhand notions and time-worn philosophies. There sat Beatty, perspiring gently, 
the floor littered with swarms of black moths that had died in a single storm. Mildred stopped screaming as quickly as she had started. Montauk was not listening. There's only one thing to do, he said. Sometime before tonight when I give the book to Beatty, I've got to have a duplicate made. You'll be here for the white clown tonight, and the lady's coming over? cried Mildred. Montauk stopped at the door with his back turned. Millie? A silence. What? Millie? Does the white clown love you? No answer. Millie, does... He licked his lips. Does your family love you, love you very much, love you with all their heart and soul, Millie? He felt her blinking slowly at the back of his neck. Why'd you ask a silly question like that? He felt he wanted to cry, but nothing would happen to his eyes or his mouth. If you see that dog outside, said Mildred, give him a kick for me. He hesitated, listening at the door. He opened it and stepped out. Before we continue, let's go back to our notes and mark down what we have learned. So, Antog has a copy of the Bible. And let's also ask this question. Why did he ask Mildred the question about her shows? What was the answer that he was hoping to get from her? And why was he so frustrated with what he got? Let's also add this in. Montag decides to have a copy of the Bible. Bible made. He hesitated, listening at the door. He opened it and stepped out. The rain had stopped and the sun was setting in the clear sky. The street and the lawn and the porch were empty. He let his breath go in a great sigh. He slammed the door. He was on the subway. I'm numb, he thought. When did the numbness really begin in my face and my body? The night I kicked the pill bottle in the dark like kicking a buried mine? The numbness will go away, he thought. It'll take time, but I'll do it, or Faber will do it for me. Someone somewhere will give me back the old face and the old hands the way they were. Even the smile, he thought. The old burnt-in smile, that's gone. I'm lost without it. Subway fled past him, cream tile, jet black, cream tile, jet black, numerals and darkness, more darkness than the total adding itself. Once as a child, he sat upon a yellow dune by the sea in the middle of the blue and hot summer day, trying to fill a sieve with sand because some cruel cousin had said, Fill this sieve and you'll get a dime. And the faster he poured, the faster it sifted through with a hot whispering. His hands were tired, the sand was boiling, the sieve was empty. Seated there in the midst of July, without a sound, he felt the tears move down his cheeks. Now as the vacuum underground rushed him through the dead cellars of town, jolting him, he remembered the terrible logic of that sieve, and he looked down and saw he was carrying the Bible open. There were people in the suction train, but he held the book in his hands, and the silly thought came to him. If you read fast and read it all, maybe some of the sand will stay in the sieve. But he read, and the words fell through, and he thought, in a few hours there will be beauty, and here will be me handing this over, so no phrase must escape. Each line must be memorized. I will myself to do it. He clenched the book in his fists. Trumpets blared. Denim's Dandifritz. Shut up, that Montauk. Consider the lilies of the field. Denim's Dentifris. They toil not. Denim's. Consider the lilies of the field. Shut up, shut up. Dentifris. He tore the book open and flicked the pages and felt them as if he were blind. He picked up the shape of the individual letters, not blinking. Denim, spelled D-E-N, they toil not. Neither do they a fierce whisper of hot sand through the empty sieve. Denim's does it. Consider the lilies, the lilies, the lilies. Denim's dental detergent. Shut up, shut up, shut up. It was a plea. A cry so terrible that Montag found himself on his feet, the shocked inhabitants of this loud car staring, moving back from this man with the insane gorged face, the gibbering dry mouth, the flapping book in his fist. The people who had been sitting a moment before 
tapping their feet to the rhythm of Denim's Dentifrice. Denim's Danty Dental Detergent. Denim's Dentifrice, Dentifrice, Dentifrice. One, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three. The people whose mouths had been faintly twitching. The words Dentifrice, Dentifrice, Dentifrice. The train radio vomited upon Montag in retaliation. A great ton load of music made of tin, copper, silver, chromium, and brass. The people were pounded into submission. They did not run. There was no place to run. The great air train fell down its shaft in the earth. Lilies of the field. Denims. Lilies, I said. The people stared. Call the guard. The man's off. No view. The train hissed to a stop. No view, a cry. Denims. A whisper. Montauk's mouth barely moved. Lilies. The train door whistled open. Montauk stood, the door gasped, starting shut. Only then did he leap past the other passengers, screaming in his mind, plunge through the slicing door only in time. He ran on the white tiles up through the tunnels, ignoring the escalators because he wanted to feel his feet move, arms swing, lungs clench unclenched, feel this throat go raw with air. The voice drifted after him, denims, denims, denims. The train hissed like a snake. The train vanished in its hole. We'll end this section here. Let's jump back here um, in our notes on the chapter. Montag is reading the Bible openly on the subway. End our chapter and our reading there.